Okay, and good morning, everyone. I believe we are going to get started. I have 10 o'clock today. Um, we have several of our presenters that are joining us from the field while they're in the middle of different research projects and doing other things today. So uh, we're gonna try to keep kind of on track, give each one of them 10 minutes or so maximum to kind of give you some information on some production topics that might be related to your operations. Um, from the economic standpoint, and we'll kind of move forward from there. So um, with that, I think I will uh, kick it off with Olivia. Olivia, I'll let you introduce yourself a second while I find your PowerPoint. Perfect. Thanks, Heather. Um, so like Heather said, my name is Olivia Amundsen. I am the cow calf field specialist out of the Sioux Falls Regional Office. Um, and the funny thing about this is, Heather, this is the second time you've asked me to do egg dialogues and I'm breeding cows. So <laughs> there must be a special connection. So, all right. Okay, so you should be able to see your slides. Yep. yep. You, okay. Now you have to push next for me, right? Correct. Okay, okay, sounds good. All right, so I'll get started here quick. Um, so Heather asked me to kind of talk about um, considerations this year as far as breeding soundness exam go, especially with COVID happening and how um, our BSEs may be preempted simply due to restrictions um, due to the COVID. So today I'm gonna to talk about evaluating and preparing the bulls for the breeding season. You can go to the next one. So um, to start out, I'll just kind of talk about you and importance of the herd bull. Um, really the percent of the calf crop to wean on any operation is going to be the single largest factor influencing profitability. And on that operation, the herd bull is going to have the largest influence of fertility than any other animal on that operation. So soundness and fertility of that animal is really crucial to the overall breeding success of that herd. Um, So uh, as far as that goes, when we think about um, having the fertility or the fertility of the bull, um, and if we're not able to perform a BSC this year, some things that um, we can consider or do to help facilitate a bull is kind of what, or facilitate a fertile bull this year is kind of what we're gonna discuss during this presentation. You can go to the next one. So statistically here we have, um, you can see about 93% of cows are bred only by bulls and about 77% of heifers are bred only by bulls. Five and a half percent of cows are bred by AI, but then cleanup bulls are used. And then for heifers, about 15% are bred AI, but then cleanup bulls are used. So those cleanup bulls or bulls in general are extremely important to the reproductive success of our herd. Next. So some things that we can do to kind of facilitate that these bulls are going to be um, fertile for the upcoming season um, is walking at nutrition. Nutrition is extremely important. Um, body condition score becomes important. We'd like to see our bulls in a body condition score of five to six or five and a half to six and a half. Um, and I should lay out that the body condition score um, goes from one to nine with one being emaciated and being obese. So we really like to see the middle of the line. Um, when we evaluate our bulls for their breeding condition score, we like to look about 90 days out because if those bulls are um, you know, underweight or maybe overweight, that kind of gives us time to help get that bull to the place that they need to be. Um, spermatozoa or sperm quality and quantity can also be impacted by poor nutrition as well as excess. So a bull that is under body condition score obviously is gonna have um, uh, compromised sperm quality and quantity, but also a bull that is overweight um, is going to have the same issues because some of that excess fat will get stored up in the scrotum, which will then affect that quality and quantity. So ensuring that that bull is in that adequate body condition score is really important for the overall success um, of the breeding season. Next. 
Full health is another issue that we need to look at. So um, I do recommend if you're going to do anything regarding um, vaccination protocols or parasite control that you work with your local vet um, just due to the specifics of the location that you're in. But if we look at an individual bull, some things that we can pay attention to would be Yoni's disease or lameness, um, a bull that can't walk, can't breed. Um, pink eye, again, if pink eye is bad enough, a bull that can't see, can't breed as well. And then vesiculitis. Looking at the bull as well as the herd overall fertility, I'm looking for bovine viral diarrhea or trichomoniasis, um, which is really a sexually transmitted disease in cattle. Um, if, if one is able to test for this prior to the breeding season, um, they're gonna be at an advantage simply because trick can um, spread through like wildfire throughout the herd causing um, infertility issues. Then uh, checking for leptospirosis, fibrosis, and then infectious bovine rhinotracheitis are all just things to be aware of um, prior to going into the breeding season. Next. Weather can become a large issue as well as far as uh, the fertility of the bull um, with both extreme heat and extreme cold. So if we're breeding cows in extreme heat, um, it's important that both cows and the herd bulls um, have adequate water as well as adequate shade. Otherwise that spermatozoa will also have um, decreased effects on sperm quality and quantity. Um, extreme cold, if we think about even, you know, like a few months ago back in the spring, if you were aware of that bull having any sort of um, frostbite or frostbite issues, uh, they say to wait about 60 days prior to returning that bull back into the herd for breeding. Um, a disclaimer though is depending on the extent of the frostbite, um, it may take longer than 60 days or um, if it was severe enough, that bull may never recover and fully be able to breed cows. So just being aware if that had happened in the spring that that bull has had adequate time to recover. Um, rain, uh, just making sure if those bulls are for, you know, in, a, in a feed yard or are in standing in mud that those bulls have places to go where they can stand on dry land um, because they can be extremely affected by foot rot. And again, a bull that has feed issues and is not structurally sound is gonna have problems breeding cows this season. Um, with that being said, just making sure that they have the adequate bedding and maybe mounds to stand on also become important um, for that breeding success. Next. All right, so the bull to cow ratio. So. Um, depending on if estrus synchronization is incorporated or not, I think a big question as well as misconception is how many bulls do I need to use to get my cows bred? So uh, this was a study done or adapted from Healy and others in 1993, um, and they are looking at two groups, non-synchronized versus synchronized. Um, on the side there, we have number of bulls in the pasture as well as pregnancy rate. And then on the top, we have one to 50. So that's one bull to 50 cows. Um, in this particular study there was 100 cows so they use two bulls so um, uh, two bulls for 100 cows then they had a synchronized group and they broke it up into three different scenarios so they had a 1 to 50 ratio a 1 to 25 ratio and then a 1 to 16 ratio um, Heather you can click again and so what they saw from this um, experiment was that uh, the best economic return was using a 1 to 25 ratio on a synchronized herd. So they had four bulls. You can see that that ratio of 1 to 16 where they use six bulls, there was really no statistical difference in the pregnancy rate. So 83 to 84 percent. So it's important to remember that bulls that are synchronized using natural service, those females are actually going to have or are gonna come into heat over a longer period of time compared to those that are um, being AI'd. So um, economically, we can use less bulls than we may initially think. This becomes important again, especially this year, if BSE wasn't necessarily warranted, that if we have the right amount of bulls that maybe we put four bulls out um, and then rotate them so that bulls aren't becoming fatigued or if for some reason um, one gets injured, we still are able to get those cows bred. Um, I will say that that bull to cow ratio is gonna depend varying on certain things such as uh, the mating ability of the bull, the semen quality of the bull, if we're able to 
determine that, uh, the bull's libido, bull age, and then pasture size and topography. So depending on how far that bull is going to have to walk um, is also going to be determined, um, is also going to help us determine how many bulls that we're going to need to use. Uh, next slide. So uh, thinking a little bit um, for the breeding season, some of the things that can cause high risk would be single sire pastures. Ultimately, if we don't know the semen quality and quantity of that bull, putting one bull out with our cows is going to be a high risk. Um, another one would be non-tested mature bulls with yearling bulls, simply because um, we're not 100% sure on the semen quality of either of those animals. But two, when we put yearling bulls with our mature bulls, a lot of the mating could fall right onto that mature bull. Um, yearling bulls are still learning. They really look to that mature bull as far as the mating process goes. Um, and therefore, if we would have an issue with any of those bulls, um, we really could be um, stubbing ourselves in the foot here because yearling bulls will probably spend more time on one female um, compared to moving about the herd. And if our mature bull isn't doing its job, we're really gonna cause ourselves a disservice. Next slide. <clears throat> so when we think about the overall bull management um, for this upcoming breeding season, uh, we like to think of a few or we like to consider a few things. So one being using bulls that are between two to four years of age and really kind of um, minimizing the use of those yearling bulls just so that we know that we have bulls that are gonna go out there and get those cows bred. Um, if you have the time, allow those bulls to establish a pecking order um, so that the alpha male can be established. And when we put those bulls out in that pasture that they're not gonna sit there and um, fight instead of doing their job. Uh, pasture size and topography again, um, ensuring that we know um, how much foot or how much traffic space or how far that cow that bull is going to have to walk. Um, and if we're able to kind of switch out some of those, rotate some of those bulls um, to let them rest and then get back to work is uh, can be ideal for the overall breeding season. And then just monitoring bull activity. Um, some bulls will have great semen quality and quantity however they have no libido and you can put them out in a pasture and not a single cow is going to be bred and unfortunately those situations happen so it's important to um, just watch your herd bulls to ensure that they are um, able to get their job done um, to really ensure that this year's breeding um, is going to be successful next So this breeding season, it's just really important to, again, kind of focus on that herd bull, take time to properly care as well as maintain those bulls so that this year, um, you know, you don't have to come into the next um, vet check season and find a bunch of open cows. So just taking the time to consider some of these um, areas is important to the overall su success of the operation. Next, and this is my contact information. Um, are there any questions? So now is your time to ask any questions um, regarding either the breeding soundness exam or um, methods or ideas to, uh, if, you, if you're foregoing sound, breeding soundness exams on your bull herd this year, um, just due to cash flow crunches and those types of things. Otherwise, if we don't have any typed into the chat box or hands raised or anything like that, We'll go on to the next presentation and you can either get a hold of me um, if you can't uh, find Olivia's contact information when you need it. So um, with that, I will uh, pull up Adele's presentation here. As you can tell, she's out in the field as well. And we'll see if I can find her presentation. Get this one going. Okay, so hopefully you can see Adele's presentation and Adele and we'll go from there. All right, thanks Heather. I'm Adele Hardy, I'm the Cow-Calf Field Specialist based out of the Rapid City Regional Center. So as you can probably tell from my background, I'm actually in the same location as Olivia is. Um, we'll be breeding some heifers here at Fort Meade. So we've got Bear Butte in the background. 
but Heather had asked me to visit about the economics of and maybe talking a little bit about some strategic mineral supplementation. And so I'm just gonna spend a few minutes this morning talking about the importance of minerals and some of the challenges that we have and why it's uh, gonna be key to be very strategic about what you do on the side of minerals. Next slide, Heather. So as we're all aware, uh, mineral costs are gonna vary based on operation and just some of the average ranges is going to be that 20 to $50 per head per year. Obviously, there are going to be some operations that have uh, costs lower than that and others that are going to be higher than that. But as we consider the specific challenges in South Dakota, we have some pretty significant ones. Uh, I've been doing a cattle mineral nutrition program in the state for four years now and collecting data on forage and water samples. And so through that data we've really been able to identify some of our deficiency areas and more importantly some of the interactions or antagonisms that we have so the key deficiency that we have is going to be copper um, across the state we've got very low levels of copper and in some situations almost devoid of copper zinc is another one that is going to be borderline deficient in multiple situations and selenium is one that depending on where you're at in the state could be borderline deficient or out here west river we've got a lot of areas of selenium toxicity and being able to identify which area you're in and what your specific issues are is going to be key to you um, making any strategic changes to how you uh, supplement this year. Then, as I mentioned earlier, copper is a huge challenge as far as being able to have enough copper in our forages. We also can compound that with the interactions that we have. We've got high iron in our forages as well as a lot of our water sources that can then, uh, it doesn't tie up iron, but it interferes with or tie up copper, excuse me, but it interferes with copper absorption. Molybdenum and sulfur actually work together to, uh, with copper, form a compound called thiomolybdate, which is then not able to be broken down and absorbed by the animal. A lot of our soils have high molybdenum. A lot of our water is high in sulfur. And so when you combine those interactions, we, we definitely have some concerns, which is why mineral nutrition is so important in South Dakota. Next slide. Now, <clears throat> the benefits we get from a strong mineral program is that we can get improved health and immune function of those animals. Copper and zinc are very large players in that role, uh, improved reproduction and improved growth and performance. One of the challenges or the things to consider is if you start taking minerals away, you're gonna start compromising one or maybe all of these areas. So as you consider the mineral supplements that you're using, take some time and evaluate those mineral tags and consider bioavailability of the mineral sources. Those minerals are broken down into three categories. We have inorganic, organic, and hydroxies. So the inorganics are going to be such things as your copper sulfates, your zinc oxides, uh, et cetera. They're going to be the least bioavailability, but also the lowest cost. As we move into the organics, these are gonna include such minerals as your um, amino acid complexes, chelates, polysaccharide complexes, their bioavailability is going to vary a little bit more based on um, those bonds and how easily they're broken down in the rumen. If they are a stronger bond, not broken down in the rumen, that increases bioavailability because absorption of minerals occurs in the small intestine. But the organic minerals are actually going to be more, the most expensive source 
of minerals. Um, and then the hydroxies have very high bioavailability because they have a crystalline lattice structure that keeps them from being digested or broken down in the rumen. So it keeps that mineral that we need um, available and it requires the acidic environment of the stomach to break that bond and then the mineral can be absorbed in the small intestine. And as far as cost, the hydroxies are gonna be intermediate to the inorganics and the organics. Next slide. So in an ideal world, we would supplement, provide a mineral program year round, uh, provide that supplementation. We would monitor consumption. Uh, I hear very frequently that my cattle aren't consuming the minerals, so they don't need it. Well, that's not necessarily the case. Most likely they need mineral, but there may be an imbalance with what they're getting from forage and water with the mineral package that you're providing. And so it's really important to take some time, evaluate and sample forages and water, send those to a commercial lab to get a better understanding of what your mineral status is for your cattle, and then be able to evaluate your mineral program based on those results. So if you have um, a situation where cattle are not consuming the mineral, I would be happy to sit down with you and look through those mineral tags to see if there's a, something that I can identify might be going on, but I'll probably recommend we need to send some samples in to identify what your specific issues could be. In the very least, salt needs to be provided year round. It's cheap, they have a taste for it. There ha I have had situations where cattle will overconsume mineral because they're looking for salt. So always at the very least, make sure that you've got salts available. If you have a good understanding because you've taken some samples um, of, your of your forages and water on your operation, you know what you need to do, um, there is an opportunity to be strategic about your mineral program. Make sure that you're reading those mineral tags, um, understanding bioavailability of the products that are included in it. And this can be a situation where you may want to spend a little bit more money for a short period of time to be able to increase the mineral status of those cattle. So you're using more organic and hydroxy type minerals to um, increase their, or their mineral stores for a short period. And then you could potentially use a an inorganic or a cheaper mineral source to help with cash flow. Next slide. So some of those times that you could be strategic about supplementation or you wanna make sure that you have a very high quality uh, mineral available to those animals is during pre-breeding. This is going to help improve reproduction. Um, we know that as Olivia just mentioned earlier, how important having those live calves on the ground is to the bottom line, well, you've got to have a healthy live calf um, as well. So pre-weaning is going to be the other time that you will uh, consider strategic supplementation because especially with the trace minerals, copper, zinc um, play huge roles in immune function. And if we are weaning calves that are deficient in minerals, they're gonna be more likely to get sick in the backgrounding phase or the feedlot phase. So <clears throat> spending a little bit more money and time pre-weaning if you're cutting some costs of not providing mineral throughout the summer would be key. And then uh, the other time would be pre-calving. So <clears throat> this calf in this picture is a black Angus calf. As you can see, it's got a pretty rough red hair coat and then the muzzled look and the goggle eyes is an indicator of copper deficiency, but this is not copper deficiency that that calf got after calving. This was something that happened when that calf was in utero. The mom didn't have enough copper to pass along to that fetus. And so 
it's born with a copper deficiency, which then can lead to other immune function issues. So ensuring that those cows have adequate uh, mineral program prior to calving is going to help ensure that those newborn calves uh, have a strong immune system because, especially with copper, it does not transfer through the milk. So until those calves start eating more forage and mineral themselves, they won't be able to boost that um, mineral status themselves. Additionally, it helps a good mineral program pre-calving is going to help improve colostrum quality of those females. So there are some key times that you can uh, be strategic about your mineral program, but the other thing to consider is that you can be detrimental as well. So having a good understanding of what your specific issues are in your operation is going to be um, very key to identifying what type of mineral supplement you can use, um, when you should be strategic about it, and when you need to make sure that you've got a high quality product out there. Might cost a little more certain times of the year, but you might be able to save, save some uh, money other times of the year. So with that, I will take any questions. Any questions for Adele? Um, please feel free to type them in the chat or unmute your micro microphone there and we'll get those answered for you. Um, as I mentioned with Olivia's um, presentation, if you have questions later that come up and you can't find Adele's contact info, please just shoot me an email or give me a call and uh, I will get you in contact with the, with either one of those too um, as, as your questions are so needed. Well, Adele, I'm not seeing anything. So um, with that, I'm going to say thanks to you and Olivia and let you get on to your next project for the day. Be careful. Don't break a leg. All right. Thanks, Heather. <laughs> Thank Have you. Have a guys. great day. Okay, with that, I think we're going to switch gears a little bit away from the beef side and we will begin the some of our agronomy conver, uh, conversations here. Uh, we're going to start with Connie Strunk. She's one of our um, SDSU extension pathologists and looks like she's getting her presentation ready for you to see. Can everyone see the screen? Um, all we see is your desktop right now, Connie, where it... Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and I'll try it again. Unless that was mine. Um, okay, I've, I've shared it again. Yeah, we're... I think you're actually... For some reason, it's pulling my, no, that is yours. Um, she may have selected the wrong screen, Heather. She could try yeah, to. Yeah, I think try to select your PowerPoint. Is that open already someplace? Let me double check here. It was, so. We were seeing it as a, your documents files. Huh. Okay. Yep, it's open right now. So I'll go back. Sorry. I thought this was all taken care of. Now? There we go. Okay, just got to move that out of the way. So now if you go to the slideshow function and start from beginning, I think we should be good to go. There we go. All right. Well, sorry about that. My name is Connie Strunk and I'm a plant pathology field specialist. And what I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about this morning is fungicide decisions. And really, it's all about the timing of when you see the disease in order to make that decision and whether or not you would need that fungicide. 
So we'll go ahead and get started here. So when we talk about um, proactive disease management, you know, the thing that we really want to make mention is it kind of starts back early in the season, right? You want to rotate your crops. We want to rotate the genetics out there for disease control when you make your seed selection. And we also want to rotate the chemistries for fungicides if you choose to use that. And you may need that seed treatment if you've had a history of poor stand, but we're not gonna worry about those ones today because stuff is already in the ground. What do we do now? Well, you wanna go out there and you need to scout your crops. You need to scout, scout early and keep scouting. Does that mean you can sit in the pickup and look from the windshield to scout? No, we need you to get out of the pickup or off the four wheeler, get into that field and really see what is out there for growth stage. And not only that, but you know, are you starting to see disease development? And then we have to talk a little bit about weather. You know, weather is really the driver when it comes to plant diseases. So there's a few different things that we can utilize and do. You know, scouting is utmost importance when it comes to um, disease control, but there are some prediction tools that we have available for our small grain growers. And then at the end of the day, you know, a fungicide response is really most likely if there's a significant amount of disease pressure out there. So I'm gonna kind of talk about a couple of diseases that I've had a lot of questions come up to maybe help answer some of the questions you may have. First disease here, you know, is crown rust. But before we even talk about the disease or make mention of that, I want you to take a look at the screen. If you notice the resistant cultivar on the left-hand side, you know, it's really headed out, really full, lot of yield potential there compared to the picture of the field on the right with a susceptible variety. In this case, it's resistant and susceptible for crown rust, but just looking at this, the genetics of the seed you select really helps set us up for success for disease control. So again, really recommend taking a look at those cultivars, hybrids, varieties for the resistance for those diseases because no amount of fungicide is gonna help protect that crop on the right to get you where you already are for the one on the left. With crown rust, it does need an alternate host in order to complete its life cycle. We find that on buckthorn, which buckthorn is found in um, tree rows and out in around the farmsteads. Encourage you to get out there and actually scout the buckthorn if you have planted oats or if you have oats in the area, scout your buckthorn. If you're starting to see heavy crown rust infection on the buckthorn, then it's time to start scouting your oat field. When you're scouting your oat field, you know, you need to look at those lower leaves. So don't spend a lot of time on those higher ones at this point. Once you look at those lower leaves, if you're starting to see some crown rust pustules develop on those lower leaves, especially when you're getting near that flag leaf emergence, that's high time to start making a fungicide treatment because our timing for crone rust on oats is really that early flag leaf to fully flag leaf emergence for the optimal control. If you're starting, if your oats have completely headed out and you're starting to see some crown rust there, you know, it's really not encouraged to apply a fungicide at that point in time because A, you've already set up your yield with that flag, with the flag leaf, it's already set the yield, you've already have things happening there. It's just don't see much economic benefit by applying it later and also you start butting up into issues of fungicide timing for those pre-harvest restrictions. So want to take a look at that. Um, the next disease to make mention here is Fusarium head blight. This one also has a very limited window of control. It is during that flowering time frame. So if you go early on in the season at tillering, you're not going to give yourself protection for Fusarium head blight. It's after heading, you know, right at that beginning flowering time frame is when we want to control this disease with the fungicide. You know, it likes it warm and wet for a good sporulation there. We do have some tools that will help aid in your decision on whether or not you would need to apply that fungicide. Now, again, these are predictive modeling. These are decision tools. Nothing replaces your eyes out in the field as to what you're seeing 
and even what you're seeing for the weather. So again, with these different tools, you know, the first one here is our Endon small grains disease tool, which uses our South Dakota mesonate data. So you'd find that at climate.sdstate.edu slash tools slash small grains. What it does is it sets up, takes a look at the different susceptibilities of, you know, broad range varieties out in the field, and it gives you a risk assessment. Green meaning a very low risk for disease, yellow is moderate, and then red is that high risk for fusarium head blight. That's just looking at that disease at the top. The other thing that this tool does give is it does look at some of the leaf spotting diseases. This is where we're going to look at a series of yeses. If we have six to eight yeses in the chart, then you'd want to consider that fungicide. So again, these are just different tools to help assess whether or not you may need that fungicide out there because it doesn't take into account your exact variety cultivar that you have planted and it doesn't take in, you know, it can't replace what you're actually seeing for weather out there. You know, you would select a station, you'd select the growth stage and you select the type of wheat growing. So that's just one tool. The other tool is our wheat scab Penn State model, if you will, where many different states feed into this predictive modeling tool. It allows us the ability to give localized commentary. So as you see here, Dr. Emmanuel Bayamkama was able to go in and talk about what we're seeing in South Dakota for wheat. So you're able to look at the different localized commentaries. Once you would remove that, you'd be able to take a snapshot of what it, what the scab risk is in the United States. Again, that green is low risk and red is that high risk for scab. You know, South Dakota has been pretty low risk for the most um, of the season this year, but there are some pockets that have had some moderate and some high risk opportunities. You're able to scan in a little closer. So again, just that predictive model help us set, make that assessment. The other tool that is put together by the North Central Wheat Working Group is an efficacy chart for fungicides looking at the different wheat diseases based on um, different fungicides. And when we look at the different diseases, they give a rating anywhere from poor up to excellent. So it helps assess whether or not, you know, what fungicide would be the best timing and it will list certain things on there. So it's a great um, little cheat sheet that I'd like to say that we have available for those that grow wheat. Notice that it doesn't just have head scab, but it has all the leaf spotting diseases that we worry about for fungicides on there. When we talk about fungicides and wheat, again, you know, scout early, keep scouting, the weather drives the tools, because a lot of this kind of goes into the timing, right? With our wheat growers, we have our tillery timing, then we have our flag leaf timing, and then heading. Well, sometimes between flag leaf and heading, it's a pretty short, fast window. Do you really need to apply that fungicide at flag leaf and then come again, you know, after heading for the flowering for scab? Or can you skip that flag leaf and just apply for that scab control? You know, so that's where we get, have you encouraged to take a look at the flag leaf and flag minus one to really see if things are looking clean, if they're looking clean and whether it's warm and dry, you know, we can skip that flag leaf and just wait for scab control. If you're starting to see, you know, pustules and things develop on those two leaves, then we'd encourage that flag leaf application in addition to that um, flowering time frame. Because again, sometimes our fungicides are deemed at different points because the diseases, the hard thing is there's no easy answer for disease because sometimes the disease develops into the plant at different timings. So again, that growth stage is something that we really need to take a look at. And again, a fungicide response is likely if there is significant disease pressure out there. The other disease that I want to briefly mention that I'm starting to get a few calls on is white mold in soybeans. White mold is also has a little bit different timing than most of our other fungal soybean diseases. White mold infects again during that flowering time frame. So in soybeans, that's that R1, R2 stage of growth. So white mold infects during that R1 stage of growth. It likes relatively, you know, 86 degrees and lower type temperatures, likes the moisture to really get that sporulation going. So whether we've had a lot of rain or will have rain, the key thing is what's gonna happen during that flowering time frame. 
doesn't matter what happened back at planning, we need to look at what's the weather is like during that flowering time frame. This is a chart provided by Dr. Darren Mueller at, at, at Iowa State looking at um, fungicide timing. And I just say that this chart really shows it very well. If we look at the non-treated, that means there is no fungicide applied versus our fungicide applied at that R1 stage of growth, which is that beginning flower, and the R3 stage of growth, which is the beginning pod. Our best control, so the least amount of white mold that we found out, that they found out in the fields and plots was at that flowering time frame. So again, you know, waiting or missing that window of opportunity is just, you know, money down the drain, so to speak, because as you notice in this chart, that R3 growth stage was almost like you didn't apply a fungicide at all. So again, timing is of the utmost importance for some of these diseases. So again, with fungicides and soybeans, most of our fungal leaf diseases, we recommend um, treatment around that R2 to R5, so that full flower to beginning seed time frame. And this is a lot for like the frog eye leaf spot, the brown, brown spot. But again, white mold control is that R1 stage of growth at that beginning flower. No matter what crop, no matter what disease, no matter what you're working with there, really encourage you to alternate your fungicide chemistries to, do, to avoid resistance development. You know, we are seeing some frog eye leaf spot resistance happening. So again, we do have different diseases and crops here in the state that we have to kind of watch and double check on to help um, aid in some of these other decisions and looking at the different chemistries. We have our South Dakota pest management guides that look at the insect, herbicide, and seed treatment and um, fungicide information. So, you know, encourage you to take a look at that. Just want to acknowledge all of the different funders that help make plant pathology work possible. And I'll just leave you with my contact information. Okay, thank you, Connie. Um, anyone have questions for Connie as we get going here a little bit? Okay, Connie, I don't see any questions coming in just right now. I want to thank you for your time today um, and giving us some insight on timing of fungicides for best economic return and impacts. So, um, we will now switch gears a little bit again. We're going to go to Paul Johnson. He's been uh, taking a serious look at the dicamba situation. And uh, Paul, I don't believe you have any slides. So with that, I will just let you uh, take over and give us some, some of the most updated information on dicamba. Thank you, Heather. Um, this is a situation that has developed uh, over the last couple of weeks, and uh, I believe, Heather, I, I need to keep it short so we keep you on schedule, so I'll try and do that. Um, on June 3rd, uh, the EPA was ordered by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals um, out of California to vacate the dicamba label for over-the-top use on soybeans of three products. Um, dicamba is a product that's actually been around since the 60s. It's been labeled in corn, pasture, small grains, and all kinds of other crops uh, and non-crop areas, including lawns and turf and, and areas like this. Uh, it is still labeled in all of those areas. It was just the over-the-top use uh, was vacated, and uh, the uh, uh, people who brought the suit against EPA said they weren't looking at uh, uh, endangered species. And um, it's, it's kind of uh, really interesting seeing that product has been around that long, used in all those areas, and they would uh, pick uh, one use uh, for that uh, concern. The three products are the Ingenia, uh, Fexapan, and Extendamax. Now, EPA came back and uh, after the ruling 
said to farmers and applicators, if you have product in hand, you can still spray it out, uh, but uh, you can got, not get any new product uh, from uh, the uh, manufacturer or distributors. And the problem came in South Dakota. We were just caught right in the switchover from pre-emergence products to post-emergence products. So a lot of the dealers didn't have much in hand yet. Uh, they were shipping back pre-emergence products and uh, had a lot of these products on order, uh, but were not in yet. And so consequently, they got caught with a uh, very little product in hand. Uh, since then, uh, the uh, group that filed the suit uh, has uh, went back to the courts and said EPA is in contempt of court for allowing the farmers to uh, use the product that they already own. And incidentally, in EPA's uh, saying of using this, um, if the product, if the label is removed, uh, people could use the product in any manner they wanted uh, because there would be no longer a label. So if somebody decided they wanted to spray uh, three quarts instead of two quarts and do it in a 30 mile an hour wind, it wouldn't be against the law because there was no label saying they couldn't do that. And so consequently, it is uh, uh, kind of concerning uh, that this possibly could happen and we're presently waiting for the court to do that. In South Dakota, the present 24 uh, C label allows for the use of dicamba until June 30th. So we're only looking at uh, 10 more days of spraying and uh, with all the wind we've had the last few uh, days, um, people are gonna wanna get that product on if uh, they can. Um, I really, I, I guess Heather, if there is a little bit of time, uh, want to uh, answer people's questions. Uh, because there's a lot of misinformation out there. I just tried to give you an overview of, of what is happening. Uh, incidentally, the label was only good uh, through this year and uh, at the beginning of next year would require a new label, uh, which is in the process of presently being approved and the court ruling won't have any effect outside of uh, concern with what this group is going to do on the new label. Okay. Um, thanks, Paul, for the update on what's going on and what's happening, um, especially for those that paid for the paid for the technology and now we're trying to figure out what plan A, B, or C might be. <clears throat> um, and looking forward to next year on what some purchase power might uh, be looking for. So. Any questions that you want to type into the chat box uh, or unmute your microphone and ask directly? Well, Paul, um, I don't see any coming in and uh, we have one more presenter that's joining us by a phone. So I'm going to thank you for your time this morning. And again, offer if anyone has questions that come up as they go and they can't get a hold of you directly, uh, send me a note and I will get them passed on to you. Incidentally, Heather, uh, the pest guides that Connie talked about also provide all the herbicide options. And so if you're caught where you can't spray dicamba or can't get it to spray, uh, all the alternative options would be listed in the pest guides. Excellent resource, thank you. Okay, um, with that, I think, Garrett, if you can hear us and unmute your microphone on your phone, we will turn it over and have a discussion on the weed situation and maybe some economical thoughts um, related that way. Are you still with us?
Well, he was able to join at one point. Let's see. Garrett was going to be driving to different spray plots today, so maybe he entered a, a signal free zone and we've lost him for the day. Um, he says to unmute him. Well, let me see if I can try. Was that you, Garrett, right there? Yeah, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Thank you. All right. Sorry, I'm uh, driving down the interstate right now, so you hear some vehicle noise, that's why. But yeah, so unique spring. A lot of people, I think, uh, in some areas got delayed through rain. In some areas definitely on the dry side. I'm not sure where the locations are, everybody who is on this call, but when it comes to economics and weed control, uh, of course, uh, getting early, and uh, using uh, the cheapest herbicide you can that's effective economically is gonna save you the most money. But uh, there is a critical point of weed control in all crops. That means the time period where it's gonna have the highest yield loss. Uh, if weed control is not uh, done uh, in a manner that's uh, gonna, of course, give the crop the most advantage to grow. Uh, most of that time frame, anywhere from four to six weeks after emergence, uh, or after planting is most of the time is when the critical point we control for most crops, corn, soybeans, sorghum, uh, millet, sunflower, all those. Hopefully you got your pre-emergent down, burned down, done. Uh, if that's the case, I uh, hope you got good control with that. If you got some moisture to activate it. But looking at uh, post options that Paul talked about um, in those pesticide books, uh, again, they give, also give you, the, in, the, in the pesticide books, they give you the average of what it costs per acre. So you can look there and look at the economic value uh, of those herbicides and figure out what's going to fit your situation. So again, I don't know what, what you're planting or what you're looking at, but again, some, some situations where you don't have uh, the weed issues they have, maybe, maybe you have uh, coach issues where you have ALS resistance and glyphosate resistance, it's probably going to cost more, especially if you can't spray dicamba, and your probably results are probably going to be worse than if you could use dicamba if you have DT beans. If you don't, I mean, of course, Liberty Link uh, beans uh, will do sufficiently well um, with uh, kosher, but if you have, like, if you're out east more here in the state, uh, if you're doing situations like water hemp, Again, there's probably going to be glyphosate resistance there as well. So you're going to have to do, uh, depends on your pre-emergence, what you have down. But uh, again, look at the pesticide book and see what the options, the options are, are, are wide ranging when it comes to corn, of course, for post options. But uh, again, look at what they're, what's going to cost you and then make sure you look at the site of action number. Every herbicide label has a number. For example, if the glyphosate is going to have a number nine group number, that's the site of action. So again, if you have glyphosate resistance, stay away from group number nines. If you have ALS resistance, that's a group number two. Uh, stay away from those herbicides uh, and always use an effective herbicide. That's going to save the most money uh, down the road because you're going to be applying something that's going to actually hopefully work um, and not, not uh, waste money. But the big weeds, of course, you probably know this, kosher, water hemp, uh, maybe in some areas, might be some ragweed, uh, mare's tail if it got away from you, if you haven't got it controlled already, those are going to be the ones that are going to cause the most havoc. And also grasses, if you're in a sorghum or millet area, uh, you need to put down something to control grasses, atrazine, um, other grass herbicides, uh, it's pre-emergent, um, control for those grasses are going to cause havoc uh, in those smaller grain sorghum millet uh, situations and then uh, yeah so that's kind of the, the breakdown uh, any questions with that if you can still hear me yeah we can still hear you thank you garrett um any questions anyone who wants to ask directly to garrett at this time 
please feel free. Well, Garrett, I'm not seeing any come in here right now quick. Um, so if you do have a weed type question or a herbicide spray question, please uh, get a hold of me and I'll get you Garrett's contact and get you in touch with him as the season progresses. So um, thank you for your time, Garrett. Be safe while you're traveling and good luck with your spray plots. Thanks. Um, before I let everybody go, I have a quick poll. One, I want to see how the polling situation works and how it goes, but I'd also like you to answer um, these questions, if you would, a, as you go through here. Um, if you could click on those and uh, let me know what the moisture situation is in your area. We've heard a lot of differences um, across the state, and while I'm not able to see um, where you're at, it would be just nice to know where you are um, in the in the moisture situation there. Um, I believe you'll be able to see all the questions in a row. So if you could also answer, you know, how many new pieces of information you get from each of the dialogues that you attend, if you've ever invited someone else to sign up for the dialogues, and where do you hear about the dialogues? Um, so make, make sure that I'm getting the information out and if there's someplace else we need to try. So click as many as you can in that bottom one and let me know. Um, once you're done um, with that poll, I would like to, you are free to go. That's all we have for you today. Um, hopefully if you're making some of those production decisions and making some production changes, we gave you a little bit of assistance on some of the economic considerations of when to spray, maybe what to spray, what to be scouting for. Um, and on the cow side, if you're making some of those decisions on not putting out as much mineral, uh, when the timing should be right, what to be looking at and considering uh, with your breeding herd this year as well. So. I greatly appreciate everyone's attendance. We will do this again on July 17th. Um, as you know, or if you're familiar with the dialogues, we set the topics as something that's uh, pretty timely. So I don't have a full agenda for you right now, um, but we will be sending that out and getting the information out to you. So if you could, uh, again, fill out that, that poll, I would appreciate it and we will go from there. Thank you very much to all of you for your participation um, in today's dialogues and I see a lot of re returning individuals so thank you for your uh, your devotion to the educational um, effort that we're putting out here.